during that time of Roman dominance. Africans hold high military and administrative posts in the empire. The Romans and the Greeks had no color prejudice comparable to the kind of prejudice we would know later on. Otherwise, why would three Africans become emperors of Rome? Why would there be three African popes? Finally, Constantine decided to make Christianity the religion of the whole of the Roman Empire. Now we're coming to the critical period when the Roman domination of the church so corrupted the church, the Africans began some disenchantment with the Roman interpretation of Christianity. Constantine calls a council of bishops and priests at a place called Nice, this Nicene Conference. It is at this conference that the European created a European concept of Christianity. It was at this conference that they began to take the African saints out of the literature of Christianity. Now the corruption had started. The physical concept of Jesus Christ did not exist. Now, how did it come into existence? Because the Pope commissioned it to come into existence. Michelangelo painted the picture using one of his relatives as model. And that picture, one of the finest pieces of propaganda ever projected in history, has changed the minds of millions of people as who's supposed to represent God, whoever he or she is, and I have no problem with the she. Spirituality is a way of accepting the fact that there is a spiritual force in the universe larger than all of mankind. But someone had to come along and invent a word called God. And someone had to say of another God and say, mine is better than yours. And someone had to create faith. Someone said, I have the true faith. Religion is the organization of spirituality into something that became the handmaiden of conquerors. Nearly all religions were brought to people and imposed on people by conquerors and used as the framework to control their minds. My main point here is that if you are the child of God and God is a part of you, then in your imagination, God's supposed to look like you. And when you accept a picture of the deity assigned to you by another people, you become the spiritual prisoners of that other people. Many Africans became Roman citizens, just like many uh, black Americans today I have nothing to do with Africa. I'm an American. I'm a citizen. I'm an American. I... There were Africans way back there with that same kind of split personality silliness, not knowing where their ethnic identity belonged. Rome's hold over its far-flung provinces weakens. In North Africa, it faces a new and fierce challenge, Islam. The Arabs, noticing the weakness of the Romans in North Africa, began to quote the favor of the Africans. Arabs convinced the local black populations to join in the struggle against a common oppressor. They also convinced many of them to abandon their traditional beliefs 
and pledge their allegiance to Allah. The Africans assume that by supporting the Arabs, the Arabs would get the Romans literally off their back. They were right. The Arabs did get the Romans off their back, but the Arabs replaced the Romans on their back. And like most conquerors, they declared war on African culture and African ways of life. The Arab has always been a propagator and a defender of slavery. They've always rationalized slavery based on Islam. I do not think any religion sanctions slavery. And any time you use a religion to sanction slavery, you're misusing that religion and misusing the word of God. Well, the Christians did it, and the Arabs have done it, and the Hebrews have done it. It's not right in any case. Islamic armies, their ranks dominated by African converts, defeat the Romans and push on to the continent of Europe. In the process, they capture Spain. There, the Africans and Arabs create a rich, cultured, and powerful empire. So powerful, it endures for 500 years. The achievement of the Arabs at this time is they have driven the Europeans out of the Mediterranean. The European now must go back into Europe they have no empires, no great connections outside of Europe. And because of this, they ultimately would go into a period called the Dark Ages. People are confused because when the European mentioned the Dark Ages, the Dark Ages for him were not the dark ages for other people. Concurrent with his dark ages, the African had his third golden age. As Europe suffers, three great kingdoms are emerging in West Africa, Mele, or Mali, Ghana, and Songhai. These were lands of enormous wealth, generated by their control of the trade routes across the Sahara, and the abundance of their gold mines. The kingdoms were known for their benevolent governments and their great respect for learning. For a while in history, there were only two great universities. The University of St. Cory at Timbuktu and the University of Salamanca in Spain. And the African was solely in charge of the one at St. Cory and partly in charge of the one at Salamanca. The Arabs had to some degree institutionalized the practice of African slavery. The Europeans internationalized it. In Europe, the wealth amassed from the slave trade makes the Industrial Revolution possible while laying the foundations of modern capitalism. In the Americas, the traffic in human souls creates a vast African diaspora Millions upon millions of people ripped from their homelands, transported in chains to a distant, hostile world. The European came into Africa as a guest and was treated as a guest. The Africans, uh, unsuspected, political, naive, as some of them still are, because he had nothing against the Europeans and he had never enslaved any Europeans, he just assumed automatically no European would enslave him. He had never dealt with anyone who would uh, enslave the host and the wife who cooked the meal and lie about it. Around 1442, the first slaves would be taken out of West Africa. Spain and Portugal goes to the Pope, the leading arbitrator of that day, the one person in Europe with 
the greatest authority. The Pope would say to Spain and Portugal, you take the East and you take the West and you two good Catholic nations start fighting among yourselves. And then the profound statement before departure, you are both authorized to reduce to servitude all infidel people. The slave trade now had been sanctioned. And Europeans have been told they need not feel guilty of it because you're doing this to an infidel who is outside of God's grace. England went into the slave trade with a vengeance led by Captain Hawkins and the good ship Jesus. The ship was called the good ship Jesus. The coat of arms on the ship with two Africans bound back to back with their arms tied. So they saw no contradiction in being in the slave trade and being Christians at the same time. We cannot deal with this enough because we're still suffering from this inside of the mind of a lot of people in this world into the millions we are outside of humanity, outside of the grace of God. That's a terrible feeling as you walk the earth. Because what has been taken away is your essential humanity, your human beingness. And when they take away your human beingness, they take away your nationness. Early in the 19th century, the concept of slavery began to yield to the concept of colonialism, a more sophisticated form of slavery. Slavery as a system became unwieldy, and besides the point where it was saturated, everybody who wanted a slave had one who could afford one. The European nations of size that did not have any portion of Africa, began to grumble at the Berlin Conference, 1884 and 1885. The European powers of substance, who did not have any part of Africa, now were given some parts. Africans did not fall at the feet of the European invaders. They fought fiercely, bravely, and continually. Anti-colonial wars started up down the coast of West Africa, in parts of inner Africa, and in the Congo. There was armed resistance. The Zulu wars lasted from the 1650s when the Boers arrived to the last Zulu war was 1906. In Ghana, the Ashanti wars lasted from early in the 18th century to the last Ashanti war led by a woman, Ye Asantiwa, in 1900. For a while, it looked as though the Europeans would not be able to hold on to the continent. More manpower and more ruthless treatment brought it mainly under their control. By 1884, 1885, and afterward, there's no, there was no dispute about who was in charge of Africa, just who was in charge of what part of it. We have been hung up with a myth, the myth of the conqueror and the invader as the bringer of civilization. No people ever brought civilization to another people at no time and at no place in history. It's one of the most protracted lies we ever listened to. Civilization is the art of being civil. The word civil means being peaceful. And there's nothing peaceful about aggression. Only the slave can abolish slavery. If someone is on your back, you have to bend a little to balance them on your back. 
Now, the best move, if you want to get them off of your back, is to stand straight up. There's something about an island of body water that creates a special kind of dreamer because they did not know where they came from in Africa. They dreamed of the whole of it, bring it all together in one piece. The seeds of Pan-Africanism planted in the United States during slavery years later flourish in the fertile soil of the British West Indies. Trinidad produced the three greatest Pan-Africanists, H. Sylvester Williams, C.L.R. James, and George Padmore. In Trinidad, they found, found the Pan-African League. H. Sylvester Williams would eventually call it Pan-African. He would call a conference in London in 1900. A few scattered Africans, a few people from the Caribbean, W. E. Du Bois from the United States. They did not ask for the in independence of African states then. They asked for preparation. Give us the kind of education that will prepare us for eventual independence. They were reasonable, but they weren't listened to. And yet the conference made some kind of impression after the first Congress. Du Bois would be the leading light from the second through fourth, but the most meaningful is the one that Du Bois called in Paris. As a result of this Congress, Du Bois came to center stage as the leader and theoretician of Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism wasn't exactly new because black Americans were practicing it long before someone gave it a name the African settlement movement, the movement that settled Liberia, was in form of Pan-African movement. The so-called Negro Convention movement was most a discussion of how you bring the African world together. That whole 19th century was Pan-African thought. Prince Hall, his development of the black Masonic order that he called the African Lodge. The search for a place in Africa for settlement by Martin Delaney and Robert Campbell. 1829, David Walker's appeal to the colored people of the world was basically a pan-African appeal. All of this, before we come down to the end of the 19th century, the ultimate Pan-Africanist, of course, was the Jamaican Marcus Garvey. Citizens of Africa, I greet you in the name of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League of the World. You may ask, what organization is that? It is for me to inform you that the Universal Negro Improvement Association is an organization that seeks to unite into one solid body the 400 million Negroes of the world. It was soon after the end of World War I, the Secretary of War had told the black American soldiers that their lot would not be appreciably changed by virtue of the fact that they fought in the war. There had been an investigation. It was discovered that many of the nurses wouldn't treat black soldiers in the hospital, wouldn't even touch them. Some of them died as a result. So you have these grievances pent up in the veteran coming home. All of this came to a head in 1919 when there were riots all over the United States. That's called the Red Summer. Marcus Garvey could point out, look, they don't want you here. Let's go back home. Let's go to Africa. Go back to Africa. Let's not only go back to Africa, let's go back in our own ship. Now, a whole lot of people who otherwise would not listen, now willing to listen. We hear the cry of France for the Frenchmen, of Germany for the Germans, of Ireland for the Irish, of Japan for the Japanese. We of the Universal Negro Movement Association are raising the cry of Africa for the Africans, those at home and those abroad. 
He began to dream the great dream and rescue the mind of millions of black Americans from depression and self-doubt. By 1923, he was in some difficulty with the boats and some of the people he had hired to run the boats, terrible mismanagement and betrayal. He collected millions of dollars from black Americans to buy these boats, and these boats were old and not as seaward as he thought they were. Garvey moved over large territory, maybe too fast, and yet he built the largest movement in black America before our sense. There needs to be a reassessment of Marcus Garvey and his long-reaching effects. He called attention to what slavery and colonialism had taken away. They took away a concept essential to all the people in the world. They took away the concept of state management and state maintenance. Once you are taken from the geography of your origin and forced to live in a state designed by others, you're still the slave to the man who's astute enough to control a container called the state. 